A lot of programming is done under contract. Customer wants a program, so they contract with a software development company to write it. For many years, almost all commercial software was written this way. Most of our software development standards reflect an underlying assumption that we're going to do contracting model-based development. In the contract software world, the contract usually includes a process for deciding whether the customer should accept the software as fully implemented. If they decide that, they have to pay for it. If the process involves testing, as it usually does, then we call this acceptance testing. Companies also develop software for sale, and they test that software too. For example, Electronic Arts tests its games before they sell them. Other companies write software to run their own systems, and they test those before putting them into use, or as they call it, before putting them into production. Many people call these tests acceptance testing too. I'm not a big fan of that usage because it hides a key distinction. In traditional acceptance testing, the customer runs or supervises the testing and uses that testing to decide whether to accept the product. That's why it's called acceptance testing. In these other cases, the development group runs the tests and uses that information to decide whether to release the product. That's a big difference to me. These people seem to want to use the term acceptance testing as a synonym for system testing. No, I'm not going to choose to do that. But enough people do use the term that way, or in several other ways, that you need to check before assuming that you know what someone means when they tell you the software is in acceptance testing. Local definitions vary. Don't assume. Check. Here's today's last definition. Independent testing is testing that isn't done under the influence of the development team. Classic example is testing done by an independent test lab. For example, in the United States, makers of electronic voting machines have to get their machines and their software tested by an independent test lab. By the way, those voting machine evaluations include code inspections and unit tests as well as system tests. Independent testing doesn't have to be black box. But just because testing is external doesn't mean it's independent. The voting machine maker gets to decide which test lab will evaluate their machines. The voting machine maker also pays the labs. So if you made these machines and you felt that an independent test lab was too critical of your products, would you contract with that lab again or would you find a different lab? Do you think the lab might design its tests a little leniently to reduce its chances of losing your business? Where's the independence in that? And independent testing doesn't have to be external. Some companies set up their own independent test groups. They report to a different executive from the programmers. They're run in different ways with different incentives. In practice, independence is a matter of degree. This testing is more independent than that testing. By the way, even though some people argue that all testing should be independent, that's not necessarily what you want. Testers who work closely with programmers can have way more access to implementation information. They can have way more influence on the testability of the product. There are relative benefits of collaboration versus independence. How important those benefits are depends a huge amount on individual corporate cultures rather than on some general principle. Now I want to close this first lecture with some thoughts on your quizzes and your exam. If you're taking this course from Florida Tech or the Association for Software Testing, then quizzes and exams will work in a certain way. I'm going to assume throughout this course that your instructors do things my way. They'll let you know if they're doing something different. In the Foundations course, there are quizzes with every lecture. The quizzes are open book. You can use these slides. You can watch the video lectures again. You can work with another student. You can use the assigned readings. Anything you want to download from the internet. It's all fair game, except for things that just tell you what the answers are to the questions. Those are worthless. One point of the quizzes is to help you understand the lecture and the readings. The questions emphasize details that you might have missed. They ask you to make judgments that show whether you understand how two concepts are similar and how they're different, or how an idea can be applied. They sometimes make distinctions that feel new, that weren't raised exactly that way in the lecture, that you have to think about. These questions are there to give you another opportunity to learn the course's details. The other point of the quizzes is to exercise your skills in precise reading. These skills are essential for analyzing specifications, and that's an important part of what testers do. It takes a long time to build those skills, so we can't wait until the official time for you to study spec-based testing. Instead, we start this with your first quiz. This slide illustrates the typical structure of our questions. The structure is more difficult than the usual closed book multiple choice test, and that's by design. The approach evolved over three years in several meetings of a working group of the Association for Software Testing. 
Now here's an example of one of our questions. The question asks, what's the significance of the difference between black box and glass box tests? Put your video on pause for a bit and try this question for yourself. The answer is B. The most common mistake is C. Answer C does give a true statement. Glass box tests do focus on the internals of the program. Black box tests do focus on the externally visible behavior. But that's like saying that the sun rises in the morning. It does. But it's not relevant. The question doesn't ask what the difference is between black box and glass box. The question asks what is the significance of the difference. Significance means what is the importance or the impact of the difference. Answer C doesn't address that. B does. Here's another example with the most common error, choice B, already highlighted. Many people would say that B is correct that independent testing is a form of black box testing that's typically done by an outside test lab. However, the question starts by saying, according to the lecture. I just gave you an example of voting system testing with independent test labs doing glass box testing. So according to this lecture, independent testing might or might not be black box testing. And therefore, according to this lecture, option B is incorrect. There's so many conflicting definitions in our field that it's often impossible to say that X is the wrong answer, unless X is completely ridiculous. I don't want to insist that our definition is the one true definition. But I do have to insist that you know what the lecture taught. So when the question says, according to the lecture, you have to give the answer that was given in the lecture. It doesn't mean you think it's right. It means you think it's what was taught. Our exams are a lot more flexible. These are essay style. The grading standards intentionally allow for a diversity of answers. When you answer an exam question, you should show what you learned in the course. But if you disagree with the lecture or with the readings, then after demonstrating your awareness of what was taught, feel free to shred it. Answer the question in a way that completely disagrees with our point of view. If you make a good argument, if you write in a clear and well-organized way, you'll get full points and you'll get our respect. Here are a few more notes on the exams. The questions for the exams are already listed in your study guide. The exam's questions are all drawn from this list. The exams will be closed book. You can't bring your notes. However, you're almost certainly going to remember your thinking and your approach when you take the exam. If you work through the questions before the exam, write them out completely. It's especially valuable if you get other students to review your answers and you review their answers and then you modify your answers to reflect what you've recently learned. That you'll remember even better. On the other hand, memorizing other students' answers is a pretty worthless way to study. The things you can memorize are not what's important in this course. The questions are designed to make you think through the course content in a different way. You'll learn a lot from that thinking, but you won't get any of that value if you rely on someone else's answers instead of thinking them through yourself. Another point is this. Every year, some nice student thinks that they'll do a world of favor by posting answers to all these questions on the internet. That way, Later generations of students can memorize all these nice answers. Please don't do that. It's the process of developing the answer for yourself that gives you and gives the future students the benefit of the course. Posting sample answers won't do anyone any favors.